Well, hi, I'm Ken Ham, CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And I have the honor of speaking with David Green, who is the founder and CEO of Hobby Lobby, uh, one of the most successful businesses uh, in America, in the world, in fact. And I want to talk about his new book. I love this. I encourage everyone to read it. Uh, it's not just about business. It, you can apply this in your own personal lives, actually. It's called Leadership Not by the Book, and it's divided into three sections, God-focused practices, people-centered practices, and common sense practices. And let me just tell you, uh, well, David, let me, let me ask you, I, you know, when I read through the book, I sort of summarized it this way. What you're telling people is this, put God first in everything, that God owns everything, have eternity in view for whatever you do, be generous, and also look after your family, look after your employees, and really you're challenging people in this book that God could be calling you to do greater things. Is that sort of a fair summary? Yeah, that is a good summary. And that is uh, exactly what we wanted to say in this book, because some of us kind of get off, off the track sometimes in some of these areas in our life. Well, what I thought was this, you know, as I read through the book, I was thinking about the principles you talk about in here and how much that really applies to what we've done at Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And so I sort of wanted to go through and give a summary of, what you have put in the book here and let you speak to that. And at the same time, I am going to talk about our own ministry and how we relate to those principles as well. You start off by saying you weren't trained as a CEO through Harvard University Business School or something like that. And yet here you are, a CEO of such a successful business. Yeah, and I wouldn't discourage anybody from getting an education. For me, it seemed like I needed to come out of high school and just get involved in retail because I loved it so much. So God had already given you that talent, that ability. I know that God had in mind for me what I'm doing now, and so I hopefully I've just followed what he had for me in my life. Well, you know, I sort of think about that in relation to Answers in Genesis. I was a teacher. Here I am, a CEO of the largest creation apologetics organization in the world and two leading Christian themed attractions in the world, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And the three of us that actually founded the ministry, uh, one was a teacher, that's me, a science teacher. One was a historian, Mark Loy, and he actually traveled the world. He went on game shows and he won all this money to be able to travel the world because of his knowledge of uh, all sorts of interesting uh, details in the world. And then uh, Mike Zovath, who was a lieutenant colonel in the army. Would you have ever picked three people like that uh, to say, hey, they're the sort of people that will start a creation apologetics ministry and build these Christian themed attractions? And I look at it and say, no, you know, from a human perspective, you wouldn't choose people like that. No, you just don't know what God has in mind for all of us, you know? And sometimes we don't know what he's doing in our early life, that he's preparing us for something in our later life. It's like my le early life was working in a five and dime store. And that's where I learned to do what we're doing today. But God had a purpose for the things that I did in my early life, just to, as he did the three of you. Hey, that reminds me of one of the exhibits we have at the Ark. It's on the second deck. It's Who Was Noah? Mm -hmm. And it's really challenging people. You know, Noah may have been a, a shipbuilder uh, and that God had already prepared him for the big ship he was to build. And how is God preparing you for what he wants you to do in life? And uh, I, I just thought of that as, as we were talking about that. Now, you talk about unconventional principles. In fact, on the book, it says 12 unconventional principles. And you say those unconventional principles apply to all leaders. What do you sort of mean by that? You know, I think uh, sometimes we don't have the opportunity in a public company to do what we would like to do, but in a private, we can. We don't have to be a public company where I have to do everything everybody else has done because the board would say, well, so-and-so is doing it such, such and such, but we're able to just give it a lot of common sense and try to follow God's word and how we lead the company. Yeah, you know, that sort of reminds me uh, when we first started the ministry in Australia. In those days, as a teacher, we used overhead projectors and overhead transparencies. 
I suppose you've got to be a certain age to understand that. I remember going to a program where this specialist taught us how to use and how not to use an overhead projector. And he said, what you do is you take a transparency and you put it on there and then you turn it on and then you talk about that, then you turn it off and then you take it off and you shouldn't use too many overhead transparencies. You know what I did? I made all these overhead transparencies. I had stacks like this and I wanted to make sure uh, that every point I had on an overhead transparency to teach, I never turned the projector off. I just went bang, bang, bang. And actually, I do the same today with keynote presentations, you know, or PowerPoint presentations. I have four or 500 slides per talk for an hour's talk. People think I'm nuts. But I tell you what, it works. People love it and it communicates well. So, yeah, I, I like unconventional ways of doing things. Sometimes we're not supposed to do what everybody else is doing. We need to stop and think for ourselves. And sometimes we may come up with something that's much better than what's conventional. Exactly. I love that. I really do. Now, in the book, you talk about not doing things from a merely human standpoint. In other words, um, do things in, in a way that, um, you know, what God has done. What, what do you mean by that, not doing things from a merely, merely human standpoint? I think that if we, you know, God gives all of us a certain amount of talents. And uh, I think he gives us those, but he doesn't want us to use them to leave him on the side. And so we, we really think... We really feel like that we ought to ask God for leadership in, in what we're doing. And I know that he's guided us through these years. Yeah, God is in control. And uh, I, you know, I even, I remember when I was a little boy, uh, I said to the Lord that I was willing to go wherever he wanted me to go and do whatever he wanted me to do. And he certainly took me up on that. And, you know, my wife had the same commitment to the Lord too. And, but I also remember that when we were talking about me going full-time into ministry and leaving school teaching, we were praying and said, Lord, we'll do this. But you know when you can 80% mean something, 85% mean something? It wasn't until we know there was, a, there was a point where we prayed it and we both 100% meant it, that then the doors opened. Exactly. And that's what we know that we want from God all the time and the things that we, and the decisions we make. You talk about in the book, what if God wants you to do a greater work? I think, you... I think he wishes that for all of us. I think he is, uh, I don't think we can think too big, hardly, that he would love for us to do something really to serve him. You know, I, <laughs> I get people uh, many times have asked me, now, as you look at the Ark Encounter today in the Creation Museum, the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, is that what you envisage when you... When you first started this, you know, back in 1977, actually, in Australia, and I say, oh, of course, yeah, we, we thought of all that. Yeah, we knew the Creation Museum was going to be what it is in the ark. And we didn't have a clue. Yeah, you know, my wife said to me sometimes, she said, if we didn't know what God had in store for us, maybe we would have run in the other direction. Yeah. Maybe it's best we didn't know to start yeah. with. Yeah, when we started... Uh... I came from a very poor background, and my big thing in life was just to be a store manager of a five-and-dime store. So that was my biggest goal. But God takes us uh, in His direction as we follow Him. And I believe when we make that commitment, we want to do, Lord, what you want us to do, that He'll take you up on that. Exactly. And as He's done for, for you and, and, and for us. So in the book, you also talk about God-centered um, people focused, common sense practices that are these ingredients for what you call the secret sauce mm -hmm. at Hobby Lobby. And you also go on to say that you don't want to keep that secret sauce to yourself. You want to tell people the secrets. No, there's so many things that God has taught us. There's so many mistakes that we make that we'd like someone else not maybe to make those. And so if there's anything that we can do to help somebody in areas of their life, we certainly want to do it. One, of course, is just how you handle your assets and what God has given you, how you can handle them wrong with your family. So there's a lot of things in there that we've really learned the wrong way, and we really feel like God's way is what we want to really bring out in this book. And you're happy to share that with others. I'm more than happy, yes, because we have really struggled in some of these areas and why not help someone if you can? You know, we've had uh, ministries approach us and say, would you mind sharing with us how you market things or how you raise funds? Or and we say, of course, we're happy to do all of that. You know, our, our daughter Renee, who heads up our Christian school, she's had other Christian school principals, even in, even in our area, say, 
could we, you know, uh, ask you for your advice on things or how you do things? Absolutely. We, we want to share with others. You know, one of the things I've always said to our staff, there's no competition when it comes to God's work, God's ministry. There's no competition. And if we can help others who can reach others for Christ, then we should be doing that and, and, and to share whatever we can with them. So I, I think that's very, very important. And you've done that to help us with uh, the museum, uh, the Bible Museum, as well as buying and selling merchandise that we both do. So anything that we can do to help you, we've done that and it's worked out real well. Oh, it, it is such a blessing to be able to work together like that and work with others. Now, you're talking here about uh, lessons because of pride that you've learned lessons about pride. Everyone has pride. I mean, that's a, that's a problem uh, that plagues us all because of our sin nature. Um, do you want to address the pride issue that, that God has dealt with? I don't know that God can really truly bless you in your business or whatever you're doing in your ministry if you have this problem of pride. And all of us have to deal with that. And I know that God dealt with us when the, the banks were talking about foreclosing on us. We just found ourselves on our hands and knees before God. And we've tried to think about that constantly to where we know that we can't get into that frame of mind anymore. And I know God would love to uh, sometimes to bless somebody, but with their pride, it's just not usually not just not available. So we just want to no let him know that because of him is the reason why we are here today. You know, I, I think we've learned many lessons in regard to the pride issue too over the years. I think of one in particular, and that is where we've had groups both from within the Christian world as well as non-Christian world that have attacked us and attacked me personally and put out all sorts of stuff on the internet, you know, telling lies about us. And we've even had that come from, from so-called Christian people. I think, you know, people who are envious or whatever, I don't know, but, um, uh, there, you know, what you want to do as a human, you want to be defensive and you want to go out there and answer all this. No, that's not true. No. Th and, but there came a time in my life where I, I, I realized, you know what, you can't keep doing that. And we need to understand God's going to protect our reputation. I mean, there's a place to stand up. That's true. But it's God who protects our reputation and get to the stage where we say, Lord, I'm just going to get on with this ministry and I, I'm just handing it over to you, this issue. I think we're getting wise uh, advice from our attorneys to say when we're being attacked, just leave it alone and you'll be better off. We can spend all of our time just defending ourselves. And so we just allow it to happen. And uh, as you say, sometimes there may be something you may have to do or say. But uh, I think the wisest thing is just to li ignore it. Yeah, the general rule. Uh -huh. Exactly. Um, so as we go on uh, through the book, uh, you talk about divine ownership. You know, what does that mean? And in other words, what you're saying, and one of the phrases in here, you need to operate differently to the world. Well, if you really think about the scriptures, the scriptures, we're here where we are because of God's word. And God's word says he owns everything. So that really makes it easy for us when we know that we don't own it. God owns it. And so if he owns it, then we're stewards. And we're really, really happy to be stewards. And if you really think about what you have and the possessions, your business, if you see yourself as a steward of what God has given you, then you're gonna, it's going to work much better than owners. As an owner, you can get into a lot of trouble uh, with, with ownership. So we love being stewards rather than owners, and it's all scriptural. You know, that's something I've thought about a lot with the ministry we're involved in over the years. God owns a ministry. It is not our ministry. And yet he's called us to be a part of it. And so how do we operate? I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the term risk-taking. You've taken risks over the years, correct? Exactly. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the Christian world, we would call risk-taking stepping out in faith, but doing it responsibly. Uh, in other words, there's responsibility and sovereignty, and they go hand in hand. I remember the first time we ordered books to be able to distribute resources in Australia and we, we were given an opportunity for one order and it was $20,000. That was a fortune to us. My wife and I had $200 in the bank and we asked people, would they help us if we did this? And they said, yes, we had no guarantees, but they said they would. So we stepped out in faith and ordered those. And I remember $17,000 had come in from people who said they would help us and we we're $3,000 short. We need to pay the bill. And we're sitting on our front patio and a man pulls up in his car and comes in and he says, the Lord's really burdened me to help you with this and gave us the final $3,000. 
but there was responsibility and sovereignty and uh, they go hand in hand. They do. And that's true in the secular world when you're a Christian. Exactly. Uh, working in, in that world as well as, you know, when we're in a, a, a Christian organization. Yeah, sometimes we th do, do things out of faith and God's not in it and we'll get in a big trouble. You just need to know God's with you in those times that you take those leaps. And sort of following on from that as you go through the book, uh, you quote 1 Chronicles 29, 11 and Psalm 24, 1, which tell us that everything is the Lord. Everything in heaven and earth is the Lord. The, the earth is the Lord's, everything. He owns uh, everything. None of us own anything. And that's had a great impact on you, hasn't it? It does, because if you ask almost any Christian businessman, they'll say God owns it, but then they act and they treat their ownership the same as anybody else in the world. And so we have to stop and say, well, if God owns it, what does it look like? And so we had to ask, what does it look like? And therefore we set our company up where that it's 100% of our ownership is in 1% and there's a committee that decides on how we're gonna stewardship the company in the future. And that impacts something we're going to talk about a bit more later on in regard to what you set aside to help Christian work all around the world, which is amazing. I don't know of any other company that would do that in regard to how much you give to Christian work. In fact, um, some people have said that uh, you'll be the, the biggest Christian philanthropist in the world because of the support from, from this company for, for Christian ministry. And that drives you, doesn't it? Well, it does. It, uh, you really think about it. What else is there? You know, where there's only two things that's eternal, and that's God's Word and man's so. And so if we can spend all of our life, if we want to, and things that just doesn't matter 100 years from now. So if you really think about things like that, then you want to do something that matters, and we, we certainly want to do that. Well, as I've said to people, you know, and to our own family, all the silver and gold is the Lord's, not 10%. Right, right. <laughs> it's all the Lord's. And the funds that come into the Ministry of Answers and Genesis, we recognize they're the Lord's funds, they're not ours. And so we can't just do with them what we want. We need to make sure that we're asking the Lord what to do and, and directing them in the right way. And that's very, very important. And so that brings me to the next point. You talk about stewards, that we're stewards, that we owe the company, you say, not the other way around, that stewards earn through labor, not entitlement. That's right. If we see our business as more as God's ministry, and that's what it is. It's not our private business if God owns it. So if it, we don't own it and he owns it, we're stewards. And so we ask, have to ask ourselves, if, if it's his ministry, and it is and should be, then we owe it. Our family owes Hobby Lobby. We do not owe them. They owe it, and they ought to get a, uh, a salary for what they do. And that's how it operates in our family and our business. You know, when uh, when people come to work for Answers in Genesis, I like them to understand, don't just look on this as a job, right? This is this is a ministry. You're here uh, because you have a calling. And therefore, uh, God has entrusted this ministry to us to look after for him. So look on it as the Lord's ministry, and you're one of those he's entrusted this ministry uh, to be a part of. And don't just take... Uh, the funds that you get, the salary you get for granted. We're here to do a work for the Lord. I think we get the very, very best people working for Hobby Lobby, and I think that's why God has blessed us so much is with these great, great people. But they're here because they know they're doing something besides making someone rich and working for uh, individuals, but they're working to do a ministry. And that really causes them to do a much, much better job than if they were just helping. They have a purpose for what they're doing, and they love the fact that they have a purpose bigger than themselves. That makes a big difference. And even in the Ministry of Answers and Genesis, so many of our employees have uh, said to us that they were impacted by this ministry mm -hmm. as children yes. or as young people, impacted by a book or the website or a presentation or a radio program, and they wanted to be a part of this ministry because it impacted their lives and they want to be a part of it so they can impact other lives. Uh, so I, I see that in our own ministry. You make the statement that power can cause great damage if it's not handled properly. I think power and finance, um, anything of that nature that you have, 
you have to be really, really careful. Sometimes we say that there's a lot of things we can make happen because we have the funds to do it, but we really don't want to make things, ha things happen. There's been times in our life we've made things happen I wish we hadn't have. So now that we want to really do something, we're more careful. We put more prayer under to make sure that this is what God would have us to do. So it, it is something you really have to concern yourself when you're able to do something. You know, I think in Christian ministry, we have to be very careful that those in leadership or those that uh, uh, even lead the, those in leadership, uh, that we have to be very careful that we're not looking on it as, you know, I'm in this position and therefore I can do this, but look on it as, no, we're all working in this together. There's wisdom in the counsel of, of many and uh, helping each other and, and using the talents that God has given people because they have all sorts of different talents. So let God use their talents for the mission, uh, for in the confines of the mission, and uh, don't try to just force things the way you want them to be. In our, in our company, I try never to go forward with anything of significance unless the people are alongside me. Sometimes we say we hire people smarter than this, then maybe we ought to listen to them, and sometimes we don't. So I find myself in that, in that position sometimes. We do need to listen to those that are smarter than us. I know for our board of directors and also for our leadership team, you know, we can sometimes be in disagreement about something, but we work together with each other and modify our position so that we can all come together. And often you'll look back and say, you know, that was a good decision. Uh, just as well we didn't do it the other way that I wanted to do it or somebody else wanted to do it, you know, and God uses us collectively to be able to then direct us in the right way. The Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there's safety. And so we like to know if we're going to move forward with anything significant in this company, that we're, we're all on, a, on, on the same team. Sometimes we may have a disagreement and I might say, well, let's try it and we'll come back if it doesn't work. But we really need people alongside and they're part of the decisions that we make. And that leads us to the next statement you make here in the book. Give God the vote in all decisions. What does God think? In other words, put God first and make sure you seek God's direction in all of this. I find that most important if I really, really want to do something, if I really want to buy a building, build a building, something of that nature, I really need to be more prayerful and really know that God would have us do this in, in those larger, in all cases, in fact, but uh, for sure that we really want, uh, we try to find a way for God to vote. Sometimes offering a price for a building, we may say, God, I'm going to offer this price. It's ridiculous. And it, well, it happens. Well, I know God's in it. And so we just give him a chance to say no. And when we do commit uh, these decisions to the Lord, he might use other people uh, to give us different ideas. And we have to be prepared to change as well, don't we? Yes. So that brings us to the importance of prayer. Everything should be done with prayer. Pray without ceasing. Isn't that what the scripture says? That's a, that's a word that, that, I, that I love. So I kind of follow that and I try to follow that. And the Bible says pray without ceasing. So I see ourselves going every day just through the day because we can have a lot of different environments and different situations and problems in a day's time. But I also like to think about the scripture that says he never leaves us for, or forsakes us. So I like to see God with me, Christ, the Holy Spirit with me all the time. And so I want to to really discipline myself to pray without ceasing. Then the other scripture that I love that I follow along with those two scriptures is where it says we have not because we ask not. Mm -hmm. A lot of times things don't happen the way we want, but we didn't ask God for help. And he'll let us go out here by ourselves if, we, if that's what we desire. But I love it when I see things that I know it's just God has gone before us. And that's so important for our ministry is making sure that we seek the Lord and asking him for wisdom and bathing everything in prayer. We have supporters that pray for us. We have prayer teams within the ministry uh, as well. Now, you, you're very bold about your Christian faith and you stand on your convictions. And that was very obvious in 2014 when there was a court case and you went all the way to the Supreme Court actually and they ruled in your favor but you are not going to provide abortive drugs or devices uh, through your health insurance to employees. And you stood by that conviction and you won that court case. Um, let me just ask you, I'm sure people have asked you this, what would have happened if you had not 
have won that? No, people have asked me that, and I didn't, I just felt like the right answer was that our family came together and we met Gen 1, Gen 2, th Gen 3, all different ages, and none of us wanted and would be willing to provide these uh, abortive uh, prescriptions. But I, my answer has been, the only answer that I know to give is there was one thing that we knew as a family, and that was we're not going to provide them under any circumstances. And by the way, had we not have won the case, it would have cost us $1.3 million a day uh, fine because of the number of employees we had. But this was what we were facing, $1.3 million a day fine if we didn't provide these, had we not won the case in the Supreme Court. And yet you unanimously, as a family, agreed we're not providing these. We, we were not going to do the wrong thing. And one of the things that helped us that God gave us a piece about was sometimes we make decisions in business, and I call them 60, 40s. About every decision you make, there's negatives and there's positives, and you're trying to find out what to do. But this was one of the things my wife and I talked about that was 100-0. It was absolute that we're not going to take life. And God honored that. God did honor that. And, and he's blessed. That's, and he has blessed. But sometimes I have to tell people that you don't do the right thing for a blessing. You do the right thing because it's the right thing. It's the right thing. Because I can almost give you a lot of instances when we don't sell Halloween or when we close on Sunday, we sue the government, people, sales went down. Usually there's a negative to it, but you don't do the right things for blessings from God. But I have to say in the bigger picture, God has blessed us beyond anything that we could even imagine. And you know, it, this is, it, it's very important for church leaders, Christian leaders to stand back and say, do I stand by my convictions? You know, over the years, I remember in Australia when a man had this very valuable piece of property he was willing to donate to our ministry. He said, if, if only you agree not to take as strong a stand on the six literal days in the young earth. It, it, you know how long it took me to say, yeah. no, we're not, we're not going to do that? It was a fraction of a second. Uh, I said, no, no way. And we've actually had over the years foundations tell us, if only you didn't take such a st strong stand on six literal days in young earth, if only you wouldn't do that, we could give you some grants through this foundation. I said, no, we, we, we don't want that, that money. We're not changing our convictions. And, and we all need to stand on what's right and not cave under pressure. But you have been blessed because you didn't take those. You lost by not taking that last, that, just like we. We lose by not and sometimes financially, but in the bigger picture, God has blessed you just like he has our, ourselves. Exactly, exactly. So you've had many... Um, I call them Red Sea events. You basically call them that too in the book. Uh, Red Sea event where you come to a place where it's the Red Sea. You can't cross it. You don't know what to do. The Egyptians are behind you and then God opens a way. Yeah, we found that just in this COVID uh, experience when we had a thousand, almost a thousand stores closed. Our rent is 40 million a month. That's how we pay our rent is sales that we get. We have no debt. Hobby Lobby has no long-term debt. Yeah, we don't have money sitting there to pay forty million dollars worth of. We didn't. We didn't. If we never experienced being closed uh, for thirty days, we found ourselves, Barbara and I, on our knees before the Lord every morning, noon, and night in our living rooms, asking God for help. And He brought us through that time, just like He did at the Red Sea. We've had many such events in our ministry. Uh, you know, we had a piece of property we wanted to build the Creation Museum on, and then. We lost that piece of property because of the attack of atheists and others and zoning people that changed their mind and so on. And we didn't know what we we're going to do. And so we just said, we're just going to keep moving forward here. And what happens? God opens a door and provides us a better piece of property. You know, or when it came to the museum and to the ark, we had two similar circumstances where, where we needed a certain amount of money by a certain time or the project wouldn't go through and we had no idea what we we're gonna do. So we tell people the needs and we put the needs out there and share them. And then suddenly something that far beyond what we ever expect, something out of the blue comes and you say, wow, God opened the way there. And we, we've seen many events like that over the years. I think God blesses us when we take stands. If we're not taking stands, I'm not sure why God would even bless us. And so it's, I think that's what really, really gets God on our side is when we're on his side and we make a stand when it costs us and it yep. will cost us, but it, he will come along and, and, and bless us like he has you. I think, I think there are a lot of people that aren't prepared to 
pay that cost. They yeah. cave instead. And then God doesn't bless. Uh, and in the long run, uh, they're much worse off. Mm -hmm. So you say we don't need more stuff. Don't focus on material things. You know, there's scriptures in the Bible that talks about being content. And I think God wants us to be content. We all have too much stuff. Just more stuff does not make us happy for a very long period of time. And so I think that's one thing I learned from my mother. We came from a family of six and my dad and mother pastored small churches. We didn't have a lot, but I never heard my mother saying that she wanted some material thing. She might only have two or three dresses, but and she had very little, but I really learned from her, and I hope that that's where I am today. There's nothing this world has that I want. God wants us to be content of what he provides for us, and I think that's so important. I don't think our giving can be what it want. It should be if we're using all of our money to buy a third house, a fourth house, a fifth house, another car, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, he wants us to know that we're supposed to be good stewards of what he has. And I think when we're good stewards, we understand and try to put our money th on things that's gonna be eternal. You know, in many ways, it's, it's just interesting the similar backgrounds we have. I mean, my parents and my father's a teacher, they were very poorly paid in those days. They didn't have much at all. Um, didn't have much in the way of material things. And when they both went to be with the Lord, there was, they didn't have, much in the way of material things to pass on to their uh, children or anything like that, except the spiritual inheritance, which is the, the most important. But you know, just just little things that are sort of funny in a way, but my parents, if, if they ever obtained a, a new piece of furniture or something like that, they would never sell the piece they had. They'd always give it to somebody else who didn't have. And to this day, I could, I, I know Americans love garage sales and that's fine. They can do the garage sales. Some of our kids have fun at garage sales, but I can never sell anything because I feel like I'll be turning against what my, what, what my parents taught us. And that is give to others, you know, be generous. And in, in the ministry, we of course don't want, and, and certainly wouldn't want to have a lavish uh, lifestyle. I sometimes see people on TV, if you know what I mean, and they've got this lavish lifestyle. That, that's, that's not what it's about. I remember my mom was crocheting something and making a dollar f just for a dolly for missions. And then you see sometimes people spending that money the way they should, and it is a ministry, and it just doesn't uh, equate. My mother and dad, by the way, I was raised in the 40s, and they would get a lot of their tithe with vegetables and things from the farm. And I would watch them actually calculate each one of those items so that they could pay tithes on their increase. So we learned a lot. Of six children, I learned a lot from our mother and father. And as a result, all six of us are serving the Lord. Yeah, we, we praise the Lord for parents that uh, raised us up to stand on His Word. And parents who actually, they always looked at how can we impact more people for the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what it was all about yeah, to them. Exactly. Now you have employees come here because they're inspired, they're motivated, knowing that they're working for a company that is impacting people spiritually. Exactly. Our company is very successful and it's because we have great, great people. And I think we have great people because we have people that want to come here and do something that makes a difference, bigger than themselves, something that's eternal. And so we love the fact that uh, people are attracted to us. If you don't know we're a Christian company, you're, you're hid someplace because we are a Christian company. That doesn't mean that the people that are we hire are Christians, we never ask, and that's not important to us. It's just that we need you to do what we ask you to do and be good at what you do. But because we're a Christian company, I think we have a lot of people that love family, they care about their family, and they also care about their job and really do a good job to help us uh, be successful at what God has given us to do. I know I mentioned earlier that a number of our staff would say they're impacted by our ministry, which is why they want to be in the ministry to help impact others because they know how it impacted them spiritually. And I think of Patrick Marsh, he's with the Lord now. Patrick was in Japan, actually. He'd worked for Universal Studios, worked in theme parks around the world. And he heard we're building a creation museum. And he said to us, he, he wrote to us and he said, um, I want to use my talents for the Lord. Please, can I come and design your creation museum? He was willing to come and we said, we don't have money. We don't know how we're going to build these exhibits. He said, no, but I want to come and do this. The Lord has called me to do this. That's what I want to do. And 
think of the legacy he has left when you look at all the exhibits we have and the Ark Encounter and the way in which the, the Lord has taken this to levels way beyond what we ever thought uh, possible. One of the big things you say in the book here, and this is something that I think people really need to understand, you really do give away 50% of your profits, 50% of the profits. I mean, that's unheard of. You give that away to Christian ministry around the world. Yes, we do. And God has allowed it to, us to do that. Here again, we have no debt, but yet every year we decide to give 50% of what we earn because it's not ours. When you start with it's not yours, which is totally scripture, then and you know that you are a steward, then what else are you going to do with it? You know. So we also have enough money to grow the company because we want to give 50%. Next year, we want that 50 to be greater and the following year greater. So the Bible tells us whatever our hands finds to do it, do it to the very best. So each one of us or most of us at Hobby Lobby want to be the very, very best we can so we can be as profitable as we can can, so we can give more, so that we can tell more people about Christ. So we're really motivated, and most of our people are motivated. I say most because not everybody are Christians, and here again, we don't ask them to be, And but we have a lot of people that really care to make this company to be the very, very best it can be so that we can do the most we can in our ministry. You know, as uh, Ministry of Answers in Genesis, one of our core values is to be generous, uh, generous in our time. Uh, generous with who we are. And so, you know, if people can't afford resources, we will give it to them because um, we know there's, a, there's people that can't afford those things. Um, for instance, if, if someone calls us and says, we have a group of um, young people, inner city young people that just couldn't afford to come to the Ark or Creation Museum, we just say, you bring them. We're, yeah. we're not going to turn them away. And we're very generous as a ministry. We support ministry in Mexico uh, to South America. Uh, we totally subsidize that. We help subsidize ministry in the United Kingdom, in Australia, translation ministry. Uh, we are generous in all sorts of ways because we recognize, you know, the, everything the Lord's given us is his, as we've talked about before. And so we want to be generous uh, with others. And, you know, there, there are people that come to our ministry that recognize we can't pay some of the salaries for some of these highly trained people that the world pays. Now, we want to look after our people, you know, uh, workman's worthy of his hire. So we, I believe as a ministry, we do really well there in regard to providing them benefits and good salaries for their families. But many of them could go out and get much higher salaries than some of these companies out there. But they, they sacrificially do this because it's, it's giving of their talents to the Lord. I thank God without any question. The scriptures tells us he blesses our giving and, our, and our, the fact that we have a heart to give. And he blesses that. Sometimes I think on TV, you might be told to give to get, you know, that right. it's more of a selfish, here's what I want. But when our motives are right and we give, God just blesses that. He's blessed our company because we've given for the right motive. So our motives are really, really important as we give. And I think God checks our heart on that. Now you say to become great, Focus on eternity. Well, I don't know um, at the end of my day, if I haven't done something to bring other people to know Christ, I just don't know that I've done anything that amounts to anything. And so we want to bring as many people to know Christ as we can. When Barbara and I first married, we had three challenges and three things we wanted. We wanted our children to serve the Lord. We wanted a marriage, a good marriage till, till death. And we wanted to be successful, whatever God gave us. But as we got older, we needed to add a couple more there. Now we need our, we want our grandchildren to serve God. We have 17 great grandchildren. We want them to serve the Lord. And we want to do everything we can to tell people about this good news, the greatest news that's ever happened. And that's Christ dying for us. You know, in uh, our family, I praise the Lord that our five kids love the Lord, that spiritual legacy being passed on to them. Now they're passing it on to their grandchildren. Um, we have a wonderful marriage. In fact, this year it'll be our 50th anniversary. Um, I'm sure you beat us. Congratulations. Yeah, we're only 61. So. <laughs> there you are. Look at that. Uh, and, you know, I'll never forget what my mother dropped into us as young children. It's only what's done for Jesus that lasts. I've never forgotten that. I always, I always think about that in, in, in regard to a lot of things that happen, decisions are going to make. I hear my mother saying, it's only what's done for Jesus that lasts. You had a mother just like mine. In our home, in our, in our uh, 
Hiles, we have what the, we did when I was raised. We have one life, soon it shall pass, only what's done for Christ will last. Yep. So that was within each one of the six children that was raised in our home. And now we want it in our grandchildren, that they know that there's got to be something bigger than them just coming here and earning a salary and passing through this world without letting other people know the good news. And you know, that's another important understanding of why Hobby Lobby exists and why you can support ministries around the world because it's a spiritual legacy passed on from the previous generation exactly. to you. Exactly. And now you're passing it on to other generations and impacting the world. It's amazing. I, I think even of my parents, they love the Lord. They ran missionary programs to try to impact people for the Lord Jesus Christ, to see children impacted for the Lord. And yet their legacy today is a ministry that impacts directly at least 30 million people a year and indirectly tens of millions more. They, they didn't even know what that legacy would that's, do. That's incredible. So um, now you want to become more profitable as a company, but not just for the sake of becoming more profitable, right? Actually, I earned the same as I did 22 years ago. So I haven't actually less when you consider the cost of living. So I don't do this for myself. I do this and, we, and we're and we motivated to tell more people about Christ. So that's our motivation. And uh, But we do want to grow. I want to be, we take half and give it away. And the other half, after we pay taxes, we grow the company so that we want to give more next year than we did this year. And every year we want to give more. So our purpose is ministry. We are a ministry. We're not a family-owned company. We are a ministry that God owns, and, and we want to be good stewards of what He's given us. Sir. And that's what we all are, whether we yep. agree to it or not. We do not own our companies. Uh, God does. So become bigger and more profitable for the sake of reaching more people. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I look on that too with our own organization. Uh, we built the Creation Museum. Why build an Ark Encounter? We want to reach more people. And as the organization grows, we want to grow and become bigger. Why? Not for the sake of having a big organization, but we can reach more people for the Lord. And that's what we want to do. And that's why we, I don't think, ever retire. You know, I don't plan to retire. As long as we're on this planet, I think God has something for us to help in ministry some way. Maybe it's different, but some way we need to help in, in, in ministry. I know people often ask me, when are you going to retire? And I, I say, well, my philosophy of retirement um, would be the same as Moses. <laughs> he retired the day the Lord took him, right? Um, so, but as long as the Lord gives me strength and, and breath and I can do what I'm doing, I want to continue doing that for him. What? I don't want to just sit around for the rest of my life now. I, I want to be able to continue to do things for him. And, you know, the Lord gives you over the years a lot of experience and wisdom that you can pass on to others as well. Yeah, I'm hoping my kids will let me stay here for a little while. But if they, if I'm not the CEO, I will find something. I'll, I'll ask for something that I can That's do. Maybe it'll be a greeter at one of the stores, but I will <laughs> find something to do. So as, as you think about that, you think, what is the value of a soul? Who can put a value on that? And you ask that question in the book. Yeah, I don't think we can put a value on it. And, and, and when we really think in those terms, I think it motivates us. We should be motivated to tell others about what we know. We know the Lord and we have peace within us because we are we are connected with our Creator and the Holy Spirit. And uh, so why would we not want to tell someone else? It would be very selfish of us not to want everybody to know what we know about Christ and his forgiveness of our sins. Yeah, the scripture says there's rejoicing in heaven when there's one soul saved. Yeah. And so even if for all we do, there's a soul saved, yeah. that, how do you put a value on that? Exactly. You know, I, I remember at a conference and it was sort of funny, uh, we ran out of a particular book and uh, the staff member that was with me, I said, we've run out of this particular book. And he said, yeah, but they've got lots of others to choose from here. And I, it's in the truck and I'd have to go and dig it out of all the boxes and that. And I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have said this, but I said to him, but what happens if there's somebody here who needs that book and they go to hell because they don't have it? <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, okay. And he went out there, he dug through, he got them, he brought them back. I think we have to think that way. That's the way I think when I'm working with ribbon as an example. If I can do something to make it more profitable, Maybe someone is going to know Jesus just because I worked on ribbon to make it more profitable. Because if it's more profitable, half of it is going to go to the missions. Exactly. And, 
you know, you, um, you only support organizations. I mean, that 50% of your profits goes to organizations that stand on God's word and proclaim uh, the message of salvation. Yeah, sometimes we have businessmen come in here and their money's going to maybe an athletic program in a certain college, and I just shake my head. You know, it's just, it doesn't matter who won a uh, hundred years from now. Uh, and so why don't we do something with our money that really makes a difference uh, in eternity? Now, obviously, you're so bold in the stand you take and think about the court case that uh, went to the Supreme Court uh, and people see that. So no doubt you get a tax for what you do too. Yes, we do. And uh, people ask me about that and how I feel about it. And I think I, I really feel that I would really feel bad if I'm not attacked to, for doing something for God. And so I, I just think that that's where I'm supposed to be. And it really doesn't bother me to be right. Why am I right? Because it's God's word. You know, if it's God's word, that's right. right. And I'm, I, that's where I'm standing. And so it really doesn't bother me. That, uh, to, it hasn't to this point. You know, I've often said, if you're not getting a tax, then you should be asking, what is wrong? What am I doing wrong? Right. Uh, somebody once said to us, you know, if you stand on the devil's toes, he reacts. And then they looked at me and they said, you must be kicking him in the shins because <laughs> we're, we're getting all these attacks from atheists and even from within the church, from those that uh, don't agree with our stand on God's word in Genesis or our stand on, on marriage and, and the stand against abortion and so on. I don't think God wants us just to blend in. He doesn't want, we have to do it with wisdom and love, but we have to make sure that we take a stand in in this day and time. And when you're in a world where men love darkness rather than light, there's more on the broad way than the narrow way, you will get attacked exactly. if you're standing uh, for the Lord. Now, you also sort of take risks here at this business because you're certainly not ashamed to be able to share the gospel with your employees. Yes, we have employees come in here. In fact, everybody that becomes a manager of our stores, there's about 300 come in here a year because we open so many stores and some get promoted, some don't make it, but we will pray the sinner's prayer with them. And uh, we'll have about, of 300, we'll have about 100 accept Jesus as the first time and about 100 rededicate their lives out of 300. So we've done that for years and have never been sued because we'd handle it in the right way. Uh, we handle it in such a way that we just say, here's who we love. We want, if you want to accept who we love and what God has done for us. And, uh, but we don't put any pressure on anybody or make anybody feel uh, out, of the, out of the way because they don't uh, serve the Lord the way we do. You know, people tell us that we're taking risks because we only employ people who sign our own statement of faith. In fact, we actually had a court case over that and we actually won on the basis of, you know, free exercise of religion and so on. Uh, but you have to stand for what's right and you want to share with others uh, the truth of God's word and the gospel because um, what if God gives us those opportunities and we're not doing that? Yeah, I think sometimes we're just, we've, the government's pushing us back, but we need to push back the other way and do all we can do. It's just like there's not prayer in school anymore, but are we praying now at home even? So are we doing the things we can do? There's a lot of things we can do in business, I think, if especially in a private business, if we would like. We need to be careful. We need to be uh, have wisdom in what we're doing, but I think that we need to know that we need to be able to tell people about the person that you're most uh, excited about. I remember once it was uh, one of the secular media um, people were at the ARC and uh, she was interviewing me and uh, she looked at me and she said, so do you allow Catholics to come here? I said, of course. Well, what about um, Mormons? Yes. Muslims? Yes. Gay people? I said, we want everyone to come because we want them all to, to hear the truth. And then she's talking about, but you only employ Christians. Yeah, yeah. as an organization, we're a Christian organization. We only employ Christians, but we want everyone to hear uh, God's word. And, you know, that's where we stand as a Christian organization. So you talk in the book, too, about uh, future leaders, that we need to be training up future leaders and also being prepared to change ways to do things if we need to. Exactly. I, I think that uh, when we see ourselves as a ministry, I'm not going to be here forever, but I need to be concerned about uh, 
that that continues on. And so we think about that. We talk about it as a company and as a family, that there's someone that can take my place and will nothing will change in terms of the heart of this country. And we've written down our, our vision, our mission, uh, and our values. And so we want this to carry on and want to make sure that we have a handoff, that there's very little ripple when we do that. So as a, we should care about this ministry if it's doing a lot, and it is doing a lot in terms of supporting different ministries. We should care that it continues. And so we need to spend time to make sure that that would happen. I love in our own ministry, we have a lot of younger um, people, uh, even in leadership, and who are visionaries in their own right. And we want to be able to train them for the future. And we've also set up uh, special groups within the ministry uh, to stop mission drift. So, you know, a lot of organizations can suffer from mission drift and then lose what their founders um, started it to be. And so we tried to put a lot of protections uh, in place for that. And the other thing is too, that I, I, I always want to be on the cutting edge uh, technologically without going, you know, you, you don't go overboard, but, and if we need to change something, we do. But I don't want to be like, you know, somebody once said the seven last words of the church, we've never done it this way before. Right. You know, right. and and sometimes I think too, we tend to, and I see it in the culture and I see it in a lot of the church, throw out everything of the past and want everything of, of you know, something new. I believe you should have the best of the old and the best of the new. It's sort of like with music, you know, sometimes I think there are churches uh, that their philosophy is, um, you know, none of the none of the past and the worst of the new. <laughs> I think it should be the best of the old and the best of the new, and uh, put all that together. And I, I see that in regard to uh, an organisation or or a ministry, because there's things you learn and there's principles that you're not going to change. Other things need to change. Yeah, and that's why it takes a group of people that we come together and really bounce off a lot of ideas from each other, and we are willing to change. And you need to be willing to change. Certainly things are different than they were 10 years ago in, in retail. So you don't have to hang on to everything. But there's a lot of real solid principles, as you would say, even in the church that are still good today. And just a few more things here to sort of sum up and then, then uh, let you sort of uh, have the uh, final say here, the final word uh, in regard to um, what, the, what the book is saying, what you've said through the book and what you've learned. Um, first of all, inheritance uh, or heritage. Um, you know, when you're talking about uh, the, the, the younger generations, and particularly in re your own family, um, you are not just giving them uh, this ministry to become, or this business to become millionaires. That's right. Sometimes I've said, and my wife and I have said, the hardest thing to do is not to do for our children. Now, we have great children, they're serving the Lord, but one of the things that I could do would really mess them up is to have them to have multi-millions and billions of dollars worth of value where they could choose not to work or to work, although I have great, great children. But I think one of the toughest times in my life was when I was saying, what do I do with this company? And I was being advised by outsiders, Christian outsiders, to hand this down to my children and their children. So I would be making millionaires out of my great grandkids. I've got two that are coming on and this would be, this is where I couldn't sleep at night. And that's where God really told me and, and taught me what I said. I always said God owned it, but I didn't know what it meant until he asked me when I was praying in the backyard, well, what would you do if the Jones family owns it? And then all of a sudden I knew I have nothing to give. And so with that, I said, I have nothing to give, kids. This is not ours. It's God. And we're going to put it in such a way, in such a form. So 100% of the voting stock is in a trust that our family comes together and we guide this company to where that it's given and it's seen as a ministry. So we are a ministry, not a family business. And so you want to make sure you look after family and you also want to make sure you look after your employees as well. Exactly. There was a particular time that I knew that the Lord just said, I put these people in your charge. And at that time, I really did a lot of things, uh, you know, like our minimum wage is as high as anybody's at eighteen fifty an hour. We have a, a uh, we have seven uh, chaplains. We have a, uh, a clinic here. So we really feel like that if I love my family and I care about the hours they work, I should love the families of everybody that's working here. 
So I think God wants me to see through the lens of these people are in your charge and you need to do everything you possibly can, even before you take the money and give to missions. We think we are first responsible for those that God has sent us. I've often said to our staff, you're our greatest asset yeah. and we want to look after you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do the best we can to look after them. And we know a lot of them sacrifice time as well. And we don't want that to affect their family. We realize family is, is very, very important. Uh, but we also want to look after our staff. And we also want our staff to have ownership in the sense of knowing they're a part of this ministry. And so they have ownership in, in regard to what they're involved in. And you do the same, don't you? Exactly. We have notes going out every month. We call it the big picture and we tell people the ministries we're involved in. You're part of this. We could do this without you. So it's really important for them, many of them, to know that they're part of the ministry that we're involved in. Now, you also uh, tell people, be careful that you don't do too many things and you're not focusing on the things you can do best. Right. Well, that's both in the business uh, because we have been known to get out and go too many different directions, but I think it's important in the business to do something really, really well. We want to be, even though we have a Christian bookstore that does a chain that does very well, and I think we're the only chain out there now, and we also Hobby Lobby. We're really committed to be the very, very best that we can be uh, at being the very best arts and crafts store, and I think that God expects of that. I mean, His Word says, whatever your hands finds to do, be the very, very best. And as Christians, we should be good at what we do. We should work hard at it and be the very best. You know, our leadership uh, team and with other staff often meet and we look at all the things that we could do. And people have all sorts of great ideas. And some of our supporters have great ideas too, but we can't do everything. And we have to, have to say, what is our mission? Uh, and to make sure that, you know, something fits with our mission and then to be able to sort of bring it all down and say, we're gonna prioritize and we're gonna do these things well. We can't do everything, but we wanna do these things well. God doesn't expect us to do everything. No, I don't think he's put us on this planet to do everything well, but I think, and I tell people, God is, I have five brothers and sisters are all pastors or pastor's wife and I'm a merchant, but I say, God call me to be a merchant. My calling is to be a merchant, but I think he's, he will also, uh, he will anoint me to be an anointing. I feel his anointing when I come to work and I'm asking God for leaderships and, and to lead me in, in the day-to-day -day things that I do. So God will be with you and the Holy Spirit will guide you. And you make sure people understand the clear mission and vision of Hobby Lobby, of what, what you're on about, as we do with our ministry that, you know, our staff all know. We, we have a mission statement, we have a core values, we have vision statement, and then our emphasis on biblical authority and the gospel. And at Hobby Lobby, uh, your staff know the clear vision, uh, the mission that you have for, for this particular ministry. And it is a ministry, as exactly. you said. Exactly, definitely a ministry, yeah. So the book, Leadership Not by the Book, uh, by uh, David Green and with Bill High. Who is Bill High? Bill High has a uh, foundation in which we really funnel all of our giving through because it really works well to take it and to put it one one place. And so it, accounting wise, and sometimes the money sits there at the end of the year, we have to give half of our earnings. And so it goes in there by December 31st and it sits there and then our family comes together to decide where we give our money on a monthly basis. So it, it's a really good uh, ministry that he has in Signature. I really want to encourage all of you to get this particular book, Leadership Not by the Book. I found it extremely helpful for me. I, I loved reading it and I enjoyed learning about the principles that uh, David has applied here at Hobby Lobby. and. These principles come from God's word and they need to be applied in our daily lives, in our businesses. It's gonna be a challenge to a lot of us as well. Uh, David, I wanna thank you for spending the time with me, but is there anything else you'd like to say to finish off in, in regard to you know the book, the ministry you're involved in that you would like people to know? No, I think I could just uh, uh, maybe repeat the fact that we really feel like that prayer is so important in our lives. I love my wife that she is a real prayer warrior. She'll get up in the middle of the night and she prays. And I think it's, it's bigger than what we think it is. And that is just for us to come along and ask God's guidance in, in our life, in our family, in our business. And uh, he'll certainly do that. 
So, David, thank you for spending the time with me. Thank, thank you, you for writing this book. Thank you for all that you do in supporting uh, the ministry of proclaiming God's word and the message of salvation throughout the world. And we appreciate you for what you're doing and what God has led you to do. Thank you.